Morning. Brett, fire away. What we got? Uh, Chris, I want to talk about the running game, and Mac talked to about kind of some struggles versus second down and some negative run plays. I was wondering what you think the issues it is, how you can fix it, concerns you saw. I run game wise, I think uh, any any time, and I told our our all line and, and our whole offense this uh, last week, and I said it on Sunday. When we run the football, whether we run it 50 times or 10, it just it needs to be efficient, and uh, and that that's probably my biggest disappointment right now is that we're not more efficient, you know, more consistent. So we hit, we we pop one for 30, we pop one for 40, we pop one for 20, and then we have you know, our one yard gain and our zero yard gain. And so two weeks ago, it was uh, the majority of the issues were in the backfield. And this week, that's not the case. The, the, the runs that did not pop this week, they were, they were more about up front. This was a front that moved a lot and they gave us some issues with, they pressured the entire time. This is the most pressure we've seen on base downs from a team, maybe in two years. And so we knew it was going to be a challenge. We also knew they were going to have seven, sometimes eight in the box. We knew it was going to be tough to run the ball this week. We wanted to be a little bit more efficient with it. But I will point out, I mean, it, this is, this is uh, very similar to kind of like the 2020 year when we ran the ball for 550 against Miami and we threw the ball for 550 against Wake. Those were two games that uh, the defense was obsessive about defending one end of the offense over the other. And when you take what they give you, which is what we really want to do, it, it doesn't upset me in a game like this because this game is very similar to the way it was at, uh, at Wake a few years ago. You know, they, they had seven in the box, sometimes eight. They gave up a lot of grass. They cut a lot of people loose. Um, they covered with fewer people. They gave us a lot of, a lot of things in the passing game. And, and that's, why, that's why the passing game was as effective as it was. You know, I could... We could keep banging our head against the wall to run the ball when they have a stacked box, or we can take what they give us, and that's what we do. I, I just, you know, we ran the ball less this weekend because of what they did defensively, but I still, when we do run it, um, our, our, our plight right now is to just be more efficient when we do run the football, regardless of how much it is. You spoke about pairing down the running back rotation. How did that go? Uh, we, we handled it the way we wanted to. Coach Porter had it. We, it, was, it was a majority. Uh, I'd, I'd say we majored in Caleb and Omarion, and then we utilized uh, DJ and um, George in some situational areas. George really didn't play till later in the game. He, he was earmarked for a few plays. We didn't get to those plays. Uh, DJ played a little bit more than we, we had planned. Uh, not that that's an issue, but uh, we were in some – third down situations and he is he's been the third down guy he's not solely the third down guy but he has been that guy and he did a fantastic job for a running back to be as impactful in a game without running it uh, as DJ was on Saturday I mean he really helped our football team with his pass protection and the things that he did in that aspect of the game and so you know caught the swing out of the backfield all that stuff so you know, he didn't uh, carry the ball, which is what most running backs do, you know, when they're out there. But he was uh, as impactful as he could be away from the football. So we were really happy, you know. And I, and I think that's DJ's way of saying, I want to be out there and I'm going to contribute, you know, make an impact when I'm there. So the three of those guys did a good job. We, we have to keep working as an entire unit to, to improve the run game. Well, it was. I mean, we, we get our back out a bunch, you know, and uh, but there are times that uh, we need to ask him to step up and protect. Uh, DJ, as I said, you know, a week or two ago has replaced British in in that role of being the one that is the veteran, the one that uh, is the most well-rounded in terms of he can catch the football, he can run the football, and he may be our best pass protector right now. And so uh, and he'll stick his nose in there and block anybody. He doesn't care, and, and, and he does a good job of it. And so that is really the role that British held, you know. And, and uh, so losing British, we thought we might lose that constant, you know, that stable guy. 
and we haven't. DJ has stepped in, and so we miss British, but DJ's at least stepped in and said, hey, I can do this job too, and he, he helped our football team on Saturday without question. No, and the, the truth is, you know, uh, somebody texted me, a former tight end texted me, and uh, he was happy to see, because we, we utilized him in the past, and he, you know, what I, my response was, I said, we, we, we use him when we have him, right? We haven't had the tight end depth that we have right now, right? Last year, John Copenhaver was a guy that was developing, but he wasn't, you know what I mean? And, and Kamari, it was a year ago. Kamari's a year better now. You know, and Bryson wasn't completely established. We started heating him up towards the end. Of, this is the, th the first time uh, since I've been here that we've had three uh, fairly prolific tight ends for the position and three healthy tight ends. You know, and, and uh, they all kind of have their strength. I don't think that they have weaknesses. They have stronger areas than other areas. So I really don't have to, to know who's out there to call the play. Uh, do we earmark some things for Bryson Nesbitt? Yes, but w right now at the tight end spot, you know, I've got Kamari in mind for a couple and John in mind for a couple, and there's, no, there's never going to be a key or a tendency with the three tight ends. Hey, when John's in, they're running the ball. Hey, when Kamari's in, we're throwing play action. Hey, when Nesbitt's in, we're throwing down the field. You would think that, but um, it's been pretty balanced, and so it's a, it's a tribute to those three. I think we try in this offense to use whatever weapons we have. And right now, we have legitimate weapons at tight end, and I use them. If they weren't playing very well, the tight ends would not be very prevalent in the offense. And that's, that's really, it's dictated by the, the talent base. And with Miami, are you talking to the offense basically in the similar ways to before the Notre Dame game, where it's, look, this defense has four and five star players pretty much everywhere? I, I know we try to respect everybody that we play, obviously. Um, you just, each week, you look at who you're playing. What are their major strengths? What do they take away the most? What do they do a good job of taking away? And then after that, because I, th I think to look at their strengths first is to say, okay, who do we have to, are there any game changers out there that we know we have to be aware of? Um, because just to run the basic play with them out there, he's a game changer. And uh, if we don't account for him, chip him or double team him or occupy him somehow or run away from him, whatever we have to do, throw away from him, you identify those guys first so we're not planning an attack without having any idea where their strengths are from a personnel standpoint. And then when that's done, then we go into working on our matchups, whether it's in the run game, screen game, or pass game. But now we're trying to find the weaknesses so that we can ID those and make sure we get our best people on their worst people. And that, that's really the process every week. So I don't, really the opponent doesn't change what we say or what we do, it, just the approach is the same. I think uh, sometimes you find more game changers with some teams than others. Sometimes you find more weaknesses with some teams than others. Um, there aren't many with Miami. They are very talented. Um, it's a fast football team. They cover ground really, really well. Um, they play hard. I think they are uh, very, very athletic and very long and rangy. And so it's, it's definitely for everybody, receiver right on down to the O-line, I think it's going to be a huge athletic challenge this week. Score more touchdowns in the red zone with one of the emphasis in the offseason. You spoke about it with us in the summer. Matt talked about it a lot in the spring and summer. He said a few minutes ago that because you guys made it such a point of emphasis, one of the reasons it's improved, how much does Drake's So the best thing about this locker room and this team because of the character base that we have is when you emphasize something to these guys, we usually get better at it. You know, and, that, and I tell them that. I said, I, if, if we're not doing a lot wrong and we have one or two things to get better at and we can focus in on getting better at those, typically that's where the focus goes and you get, you get you know, there's high energy and, and mental focus on trying to get better at what we're doing. These guys really honestly ask questions and want to know what we're not doing well. And, that, and that's why I think we get better every week because we keep taking the weakest, weakest link and moving it forward. And so we, we're a better team, both mentally and physically, each week that we're done with a, with a week of preparations. Having said that, um, we emphasize red zone in the offseason. 
Um, that was one of the, that and minimizing sex, right? And we have, and you look at what we're doing right now, we didn't give a sack up in this last game, and I think we have seven on the season. So that has been a tremendous improvement. The red zone's been a tremendous improvement. Um, if I was going to really identify why we're doing better in the red zone right now, I'd say I'd like to tell you it's scheme. I'd like to tell you it's, it's uh, you know, all of these skilled players that we have. But the biggest reason we're better in the red zone is you cannot hide the offensive line in the red zone. You can't hide the offensive line on the goal line. And so those guys have gotten much better, particularly pass protection in the red zone. So it's given us an opportunity to do some other things. And then I don't know if it's an added advantage that we have Drake because Sam was pretty good weapon as a quarterback in the red zone as well. So I, I feel like we, we have the same thing. You know, they're different athletes. We do a lot of the same things with Drake that we did with Sam. Probably, as I've said numerous times, Sam, we hit things vertically and more downhill because of his strength and his aggressiveness. And we can do more on the perimeter with Drake. But to have that added factor in the red zone of being able to run your quarterback or move your quarterback is always helpful in the red zone because of how limited you are field-wise. But I, I think the single biggest improvement is up front, and that has changed you know, our success rate in the red zone and on fourth down. So I, I've now recruited. I've now recruited mom and dad, right? And uh, and I and I think coach strategically used the word uh, we don't want to be selfish, right? And and it's selfish in that uh, let, let's be smart because we want to be able to get up after these jumps and after these plays and be able to help the team on the next play and the next day and the next game. Um, but now I'm I'm on the phone with with mom and dad and and I'm recruiting their help to to try and quell Drake. These guys are competitors, man. It was the problem with Sam too, you know, and, and uh, what I'm trying to get him to realize is he is a great distributor of the football and we have a lot of weapons to distribute the ball to. And, and the quarterback can be a weapon in the offense and, he, and they always have been. You know, we've had some really immobile guys in the past and they were the best distributors because they couldn't run at all. You know, you almost want to just chain him back there and, and just, uh, not let him loose unless it's a planned run or the play breaks down. And that's really when we want his legs to be a weapon. We have a planned quarterback run. Now, I will say uh, there are a lot of plays that we have um, that I call pass draws, you know. So they are legitimate pass plays, and we are pass protecting. And some of these plays, though, when, they, when the defense does a great job covering them, there's an automatic built-in quarterback draw there and, and Drake is very aware of what those plays are and when they're going to create some space for him and he and Sam both have done a terrific job of attacking plays downhill and then it winds up looking like a draw or a scramble and, and really it's a little bit more by design and then there's other plays that that uh, you know we're doing a lot of things over the middle or running some short stuff or some quick hitters those are not built-in draw plays for the quarterback because defenders are still there five, six, eight yards around the line of scrimmage and they can track the QB. And those are the plays where you see Drake throwing it away if we're not completing one of the quick hitters. So I think we've done a good job there of knowing when to utilize our legs. I just want them to be smarter and, and stay healthy. Uh, so now we're down to look, if you're near the goal line and you need it to win the game, do whatever you want as long as you, you secure the football. Right. The other thing that makes me nervous when you jump is very few people naturally hold the ball up against their body in a secure position when you jump. When you jump, you need momentum. When you jump, your arms and your legs tend to flare out, and that means the ball is away from your body. And that's as much, uh, you know, we saw that with Javante Williams a couple years ago in the Duke game. You know, and it's hard to do that. Um, so goal line, got to win the game, uh, maybe in the championship. I mean, you got, it's down to like next to nothing. We don't want to lose or, or leap and leave the, leave the floor anymore. So I said save that for basketball. So hopefully, uh, hopefully he'll hear me this week. He says that's his instinct, though. He has to fight the instinct. So how do you as a coach help a guy fight his instinct? Yeah, that's, that is the built-in quarterback excuse around the country. It is, right? Like we just – 
I and I and they are they're 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 ultimate competitors. They are, and they want to go for every. What what I showed them, you know, and joking aside, what we said was, look, what are you gaining by jumping? You're 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 taking hits, okay, to your lower body. You're landing on your upper body. Here, are, you know, broken collarbone, dislocated shoulder, concussion, neck issue, potential of fumbling the football. That's what you got on one side, on the negative side of, of leaping and trying to go over people. And then it also, people know down in the red zone, this cat's going to jump. You know, and they want it, they're going to take shots on you. You know, and so what are you getting on the positive side? Another yard, another two yards? You know, in one case, the first time we saw him do that, it was a touchdown. Right, but outside of that, the other two times that he jumped, we really aren't, we're not gaining much out of it. Slide, go down, run out of bounds, get on the ground. That way you're healthy enough to execute the next play. And I, I'm hoping, I think that that's going to be enough of a conversation that we shouldn't have this problem anymore. I would say when you, when you cut people loose like that defensively, whether it's a run play or, you know, you're, you're not – there's no CRC on the screen or there's, there's just poor coverage on a play, especially when you have two weeks. You go back and you just – usually when you cut something loose like that, somebody's making a mistake. Somebody's not techniquing it the right way. They don't have their eyes in the right place. Um, they're, they're not aligned properly. You know, uh, they, they get their eyes on some – you know, of the candy in the play, what, whatever the issue is, when you have big, wide open plays like that, it's, it's mistake driven. Sound, good, X and O football, you typically don't have those type of plays. Which, so for me, and I, I can't speak for Miami, but I would think, you know, they're good at what they do, they do what they do. Kevin Steele is, is an outstanding defense coordinator. I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. I've coached against him before, and he's, um, they're, they're not going to go – they're not putting in a new package here for a couple of these plays. What they're going to do is they're going to correct. I don't expect to get the same advantage when we play them. They're not about – a good coaching staff, and they are, are not about to give up the same stuff that they just gave up against the previous team, particularly when they have a week to go back to fundamentals and, and, and teach some of the things that maybe they didn't do so well on those plays. You know, and again, I can't speak for them, but I, I don't know that uh, – let me say this. One of the most common things you do is look at what everybody else had success with against certain defenses. And I'm always careful, though. I want to run what we do. I don't care what other people are doing. I don't think that uh, watching the other games is a bad reference. But typically, when you have two and three teams that are attacking a defense and, and they're winning and they have success on certain looks – it's going to be harder as the season goes on to continue beating them with the same stuff because a good coaching staff is going to correct that and get it righted so that it doesn't keep happening. So, you know, you, you use things as a reference and as a resource and then you weigh out whether or not you want to attack them in the same way or uh, you, you don't. And we're doing the same thing with Miami just like we do with everybody else. What's things out for snow? Ooh, well, they're playing eight, nine, 10, 12 guys on the defensive line. They have a lot of people that they play on the defensive line. There's a number of transfers that are in um, that are new faces that we have not played against in the past. So they're super deep um, up front. They're long, they're rangy, they're athletic, as I said earlier. And so it is maybe the biggest athletic challenge that we've had. And Notre Dame was um, – was certainly the best we had seen up to this point. I think Miami will be, um, they'll be as good. I think they'll be as athletic. You know, they do a good job of getting off blocks. And so finishing for our line, both in protection and in the run game will be a big part of this week. Um, and then we've got to do a good job when we work to the second level because they do run. So the safeties can run. Zero is a really good player. Uh, the linebackers run and pursue and so, We'll have to control the line of scrimmage, but we'll have to do a good job on second level blocks on, you know, in the run game with those guys because they move so well. Phil, what, what is the balancing act, I don't know if that's the right way to say, the art of when you go for the trick play like <coughs> you did with the, the double pass? Like, I mean, for you as a coordinator, like, are you trying to 
trying to plot these things out like I don't want to use that until this game. Like, you know, what's that what is that process like for you in terms of like when you show it does like Mac was saying, I guess you can't you're likely not to do it again. All right, that's not a play you run twice in one year, so you like to hit that stuff, you know. And uh, I did hear what Coach said. I agree 100%. I think the the throw from Drake. So we ran that play this week in preparation for this past game, and it was there, obviously. I think Drake's still running if we, if we reach him. Um, but I do think it started with the throw that was a little bit off. Kobe did a great job. He's a receiver, so he snagged it without a big problem. But all week we probably ran that thing from the from the first rep until now, until uh, Friday when we ran through it in our run through. It went perfectly just about every time. So it was just one of those things our kids took to. We executed well, high confidence in it at every position, you know. And obviously the key was can Drake get the ball there and can Kobe get it back. And, and when I mean the two of them nailed it all week, there was no concern at all. I was actually surprised that we skipped it a little short because I, would not, I did not expect it. And, uh, and I thought it set up nicely. You know, and then there was a stoppage. I forget why. I don't know if they called the timeout or something happened, but there was a stoppage in the clock. And so we actually got to pull them over and talk about it on the sideline. That wasn't the plan. We were going to run it in, in this, you know, the course of a drive. And so it's unfortunate we had... We had 10 guys hit it, and we just, we just underthrew it a little bit. And Kobe will get another chance next year, so we'll see. We'll see when the time comes. Is that list, is that list like the trick play list? I don't know what you call it, but is it a long list? Are there 20 plays that you're like, all right? Yeah, we, we call them exotics, and there's a library of them. Um, some we've carried before. Some are new for this year. Periodically through the year, we practice them so that uh, they're kind of fresh in our mind. Um, we do tend to run a few of them a few weeks before. You know, you're going to get one shot. So these plays are typically all or nothing shots. You want to call it in a game where it really can't hurt you in the process of a drive. Um, and, you know, there's just a right time. It's a field or in the game. There's just a right time to do it. We did know we wanted to run that one around midfield, right? That, that, that play we've had a lot of success with in the past. It's gone for 70, 60, 50, you know. Um, so we wanted to do it at midfield. We thought that was the best time to run it against this team. And, you know, again, if we had hit it, there was no one there. Drake had four personal protectors all the way down to the goal line. And uh, it is what it is. You know it's all or nothing when you, when you call it. And that's just how it wound up. All right. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Hey, yes, sir.